Professor Buxton, as many of you will be aware, has had a distinguished academic and government career. Uh, he is a, an acknowledged expert on Melbourne planning issues, uh, and Professor Buxton will be speaking this afternoon on the impact of Melbourne's population growth on local communities. So, uh, Michael, over to you and welcome. Calvin must be taller than me. <laughs> um, thank you, Calvin. I'll, um, I'll talk for about um, 15 or 20 minutes and stop. And then if you have any questions or comments, you can um, <coughs> fire them at me or have a discussion. Um, well, thanks for inviting me along today. And, uh, very interesting to be back in when my, um, my mother's family came from here and I kind of half forgot that until I drove up past the Catholic Church and realised I used to be an altar boy there. <laughs> um, I had a very religious um, grandmother who lived in Ringwood Street and um, she used to drag me, every time we used to go over and stay with her, she used to drag us to 7 o'clock mass during the week, freezing winter mornings. And I'd, blotted that out of my memory that I remembered it as soon as I went past the church. Um, so it's good to be back in the Ringwood. I don't come here a lot, but um, it's a very interesting area. Um, I, I want to talk more generally this afternoon a little about uh, population pressures on Melbourne, but also the different ways that um, are being proposed to meet those pressures, because we're, I think, in a very interesting period in Melbourne's history at the moment. Um, we've just come out of a, a period of a pretty substantial growth, and in the last 10 years, the city has fundamentally changed. Its appearance is changing over the significant parts of the metropolitan area, particularly the inner urban areas and the, and the outer urban growth corridors. Um, and its functioning is in the process of changing radically. And I think we're at one of those points in Melbourne's history and we can look back at them um, and you can, if the benefit of hindsight looking back, you can see that Melbourne's had periods like this. 1971 was such a period, 1954 was a period like that after the war with Melbourne's first real adopted strategic plan. We're here again. History's got a way of catching up with us. And I think Melbourne, um, it's, it's already showing these signs of fundamental change, but it's going to be a completely different city in 20 years. It's going to function differently um, the way we're going if we go on the current trends. And the, the real challenge for us, I think, as a, as a community and as residents, um, is to try to influence politicians to alter those those trends. If we just stay on the path that we've been on, which is gradual change um, along a predicted path um, of population and the responses to that population, we're going to end up, I think, with a city that is going to be dysfunctional. And it's going to happen a lot quicker than people think. I and mean, one of the great tragedies of, of politicians with um, politics to Kelvin is that um, they really don't understand the pace of change. They don't get it that all these pressures build up like a water behind a dam wall that is a relatively weak wall. And the pace of change is not linear. It doesn't happen um, all the time gradually. Pressures build up and then they burst. And then we have, we have rapid fundamental change. And I think that's where we're at in Melbourne. I think a couple of statistics really, I think, starkly present that. Between 1971, when the 71 plan came out in 2011, Melbourne's population increased by about a million and a half people. Um, and between, between 2000 and then the next 40 years, that's one period of 40 years, a million and a half people, in the next 40 years, the population of Melbourne on current path is going to probably increase by about double that, depending on your assumptions. 
at least 2.3 million, and that there are projections of 3.5 million, depending on your assumptions. And I think we can safely say on the current trajectory, Melbourne's population is going to increase by uh, double the population increase in the last 40 years. And that's an example of how these pressures fundamentally change. I think we can, we can start to project ahead now. Melbourne is, is really undergoing this period of transition to um, how can we cope with the current population of 4 million people. This increase of 1.5 million people over the last four years has caused immense pressures on the way the city functions. Can the city survive and cope as a functioning entity if that um, number doubles in the next 40 years? And certainly the way we're going, it won't, um, because the anticipatory policies that are trying to look ahead and put in place um, measures to, to try to cope with that are simply not there. Um, now, the, 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 the argument really, I think, there's two elements to this argument. That population shouldn't be allowed to happen, that there should be measures taken um, at all levels of government to prevent that, that, um, that population increase that really goes back to immigration rates and other causes of population um, to try to limit that population increase. There is another element of the, as a, as a country, Australia-wide, there is another element of the argument that the, the population increase that, that would normally come to Melbourne under current trend should be redistributed in other ways, for example, through, through our regional Victoria and so on. So there, there are ways to move populations around through intervening policies. And there's a, you know, you're, you're all aware of that debate, there's a very big debate about population um, it's probably not as big as what a lot of us would, would hope it is, would, um, would prefer that it is, but it is there and it's underlying everything else. The, the debate, though, tends to, to come down to another question. How can that population be accommodated through proper planning and integrated transport and land use planning? So assuming that that population is going to occur, how can it how can it be better accommodated so that a city like Melbourne continues to operate? Now, there are lots of proposals for that, and I'll just run you through very quickly in a minute this, uh, some of the different proposals, and, and we can just put them out there. Um, if the population of Melbourne is allowed to increase by that amount to figures that are being tossed around now, six and a half million people, some projections even up to eight, eight and a half million people. Um, the question is how can that be accommodated and, and what are the impacts of that? So what's happening at the moment is that Melbourne's growth is, has changed, the type of growth has changed fundamentally in the last 10 years. It's inner Melbourne has turned into, or is turning into a high rise city a huge amount of high-rise development both in the CBD and in the areas immediately around the CBD. Um, there's medium-rise um, development, um, even up to 12, 14 storeys occurring in middle wing, some middle wing suburbs, particularly in concentrated areas, and that, that's, that's going to increase, that's going to increase um, quite markedly in the next five years. Already, um, uh, international investment capital is, is becoming more and more interested in some of Melbourne inner and the inner parts of middle wing suburbs as investment locations, not necessarily for high rise, but for certainly developments up to 14, 16 storeys and they're, they're eyeing off main roads, they're eyeing off places like Kew Junction and they're, they're focusing, they're very targeted, they know exactly what they want to do, they know who they're targeting their building at, um, they're very canny. So that trend is, is one element, um, and this, the second element of the, of the, of the type of development is it's expanding out of urban growth. So we've traditionally tried to accommodate this population increase by expanding on the fringe, as if there is no limit to, to that kind of land, and going higher. 
particularly in the inner part of the city, um, where most of this is concentrated. And I, I, I see Bob Birrell in the audience, and um, Bob and his team have done some very interesting work, I think, on I think one of the really great challenges for, for um, policy makers, and which is what to do with that middle, that middle um, ring, spatial area, the middle band of suburbs to extending even out to the traditional outer suburbs, um, suburbs like England that have been settled for a very long period of time. Um, and what, what we're finding is very similar to what's being found in America. There's a lot of very interesting American research that is showing that lots and lots of young people in a, in a band from their middle 20s to early 40s uh, not prepared to go to the fringe, so they're not prepared to take up either of these traditional solutions. They're not prepared to move out to a, a relatively low-cost house, large house on the fringe, um, and they're not prepared to move into a very small apartment in the city centre. Most US cities don't give that option because most US city centres are devastated. I mean, the, the only people who live there are crack dealers and the poor. We're, un, we're unlike that. But the two options that we're offering are really um, not, I, I think, not going to be particularly attractive to a lot of the children of, of parents that have raised their children in that, that middle band suburbs. Um, and as they get older and want children, they're not going to be enamored by the solution. One of the reasons they don't want to go to the fringe is because they understand very clearly that there are big trade-offs to go to the fringe, that there are very poor standard of services, um, and that you can buy a house for say 400,000 or 380,000, but you are going to um, suffer the consequences in other ways of very poor public transport and services, and you can see this all the time in the media now. That's a huge challenge for um, governments, and it's a huge challenge for us as a city. Um, now. There's been a lot of debate recently about the government's new zones, and I just want to speak to that in a minute and just show you visually before I finish up what this looks like. The government has responded allegedly to these kinds of pressures by, in two ways. They've put out a new strategic plan. We've put out as a, as a, as a city, as a government, one strategic plan every six, every, every six years um, since the Second World War. We do not do long-term planning in this, in this city. And the cities that do do long-term planning tend to be those that prosper because they get both political parties involved, they have the development community and residents all on the same page and they all work together. We don't do that. Jeff Kennett gets in, he throws the previous government plan in the, in the bin, a Labor government gets in, gets a new plan, and now Bailey and Napstein government was elected and it, First thing it did virtually in planning terms was throw Melbourne 2030 away and develop their own plan. The second way they've responded to this is to bring in new planning zones, and I, I suspect that this is what a lot of you are going to be very interested in. We haven't got time to go into detail um, now, but the, the, the three really important zones um, that are interesting residents in Melbourne are the, the three residential zones. One quite strong zone, the neighbourhood residential zone with an eight metre height control and a limit of at the most two, two dwellings. There's um, the general residential zone, which is very like the residential one zone now, the general standard zone, which continues to allow medium density development, but which, which does have a height control. And then there's a residential growth zone, which is a much more concentrated medium rise development. Um, much more intensive, with a height a schedule that will probably get a height control of about 13 and a half metres, uh, but with no limit on the numbers of, of, of units on a block. Now, over Melbourne, councils at the moment have been offered the opportunity to put in proposals to apply these zones to their municipalities and all over the place. Your council here, the Ringwood area has done that. Lots of other councils have done it. Probably about 30 have taken the opportunity. 
to, to apply those zones to their land, and that's, that, that, that work has now been considered by an independent advisory committee, and the results of that are going to come out in the middle of this year, about July. So people will know um, where those zones are going to be applied, and you will know what zone your dwelling is going to be in. This has got big implications for people, because if you're if your house is located in a neighbourhood residential zone, there will be some control, a lot of control, over further intensification. If it's in a general residential zone, there will be far less control. There will be permanent control as there is now over medium density development. But the thing that's causing a lot of debate by development interests is the population issue around these zones. The neighbourhood residential zone, the strong zone, which limits development to one or two dwellings on a block is being criticised very strongly by the property industry, by the property council, by the big developers, and they're arguing to the government that they're, quote, locking up significant parts of development, using that kind of emotive term. So when neighbourhoods um, that have got high amenity are protected through this zone, they're arguing that's going to stop Melbourne's capacity to incorporate increases in population in residential areas. Um, and the government is now beginning to back off. They're not, they're not actually saying um, that they are, but there's informal kind of estimates of what proportion of municipalities is going to be acceptable to be put in these neighbourhood residential zones. Because the city of Glen Ira were the first, it was the first council that actually got um, these zones approved, and they had 80% of their residential areas placed into the neighbourhood residential zone. And the development community arced up on this and, and other development institutes pointed out or argued to the government that this was going to really limit population, the capacity of, of Melbourne and Comrade population. So other councils are going through this process. It's going to be very interesting to see just what happens. And I'll just show you how this has been applied in, in, uh, in this area in a minute, and I'll finish up. This is, this is a big debate, it's, it's, it's very, very important for Melbourne, and it's a false argument. We're, we're, we're doing some work at RMIT, estimating the capacity for Melbourne, the existing built-up area of Melbourne, without going out into new growth areas, the four or five major growth areas, just the existing capacity of Melbourne, to accommodate significant increases in population. So we're moving to that second argument. If the population does increase, which I, I think is undesirable that it does, but if it does, how can you accommodate it and still have the city continue to function and be livable? That's the big question. But governments are simply not asking much less answering. And I, uh, the sort of work that we're, we've done shows that it, it actually probably could be done, but it would cost a lot of money, a lot of money, because the infrastructure for the current population, excepting for the residents of inner suburbs and the inner parts of the, the traditional inner ring, some middle ring suburbs, is inadequate. So there would be, there would be a need for huge investments into just about every service you can think of. Somebody was telling me the other day that um, there are going to be, in the inner suburbs of Moan, there are going to be, there's going to be the need for so many more schools to be built to accommodate the increases in population that we think that the government hasn't even put this on the radar. There are now limitations by schools on their catchments. Um, there are massive childcare problems. I mean, the intensification of Melbourne, even though this is the area that is best serviced, these people, New residents in the inner suburbs are feeling the pinch. The outer suburbs are feeling it even more. So there's, there would be a need for massive investment um, by governments to accommodate this population growth. Um, given that, there is room, without pulling down the high amenity suburbs that uh, the councils are proposing to protect. There is so much land. And it's not unusual that this be the case. Huge numbers of cities all over the world have got massive amounts of land that is unused. And it seems silly to say that, but it isn't. When you actually analyse where the land is and the capacity for redevelopment, and you don't take account of services, that's another massively important issue, but just the spatial area 
there's a huge amount of land. And I'll, Colin, I'll just finish up by, by just showing a couple of, what are we on? Um, just to show how this could be done, and then we'll finish up with, um, with a few concluding points and leave it to them. So, um, that's what Melbourne looked like, by the way, in 1934, which um, I'm a bit young to remember, but um, it uh, certainly was uh, an incredibly attractive city and country. <laughs> Now this is only the 2030, I was talking about, I was projecting out 40 years to 2050. At the moment it's about 50-50. It's about 50% of all new dwellings in the new growth areas, the four or five growth areas, and about 50% in the remaining um, established area. And you can see the tremendous concentration in the central city and surrounds of that 600,000. Um, about a third proposed to, to be built in high-rise development in the established in, in the CBD and the areas immediately around. And the, the government is rezoning large areas around the CBD to allow this to happen. This is why Matthew Guy is approving so many high-rise developments in the CBD and in the areas around Melbourne. This is well thought out. The government is, is doing it. We're not telling people why, but this is what's what's happening. So this is going to cause, we've only just begun this process at the moment. And I won't go into all the detail this because we don't have time, but when you look at the areas just in the inner areas, this is from the government's own plan, there's a whole series of areas just around the inner part of the CBD which have been earmarked for massive development. And there's, there's an area of Bockland, South Bank, we've got the whole Fisher and Ben precinct, the Montague area has already been fully subdivided. And then you've got these areas like Egate, Footscray and so on. So the government has actually earmarked significant areas of land which will be redeveloped and accommodate a lot of this development. And then what they've done is um, identify a series of employment centres and mixed use employment centres and they range from Dandenong to Werribee. So what they've done is identified very large areas of land which are going to be redeveloped. And there are significant numbers of, of the, you know, the population increase that is planned. They're going to go into those large centres. But below them, there's a third layer, and they are the traditional activity centres. So this government hasn't got rid of Melbourne 2030's activity centres. It's, it's built them in at a third level. And they're going to be redeveloped. And along with the main road, you can see these red lines so there's been projections of how many people can be accommodated in these in this network of 100 activity centres, that's shopping centres, um, and main roads. And the shopping centres have been projected to be able to hold about um, seven, 800,000 people if they're all redeveloped over a 20, 30 year period. They'll fundamentally change their appearance and function. Um, and I think that would be most undesirable. But <coughs> That's not counting the massive amount of land that's available elsewhere in many, many municipalities without beginning to pull down houses. So what's been happening is we've had a development facilitation planning system which has empowered developers to go out and find land wherever they want to. And generally it's easier to go and find house sites and to pull down houses and to actually locate land that's more appropriate. So I think the trick here is if we're going to accommodate this population, do some proper local planning, councils can find suitable sites without wrecking the amenity of the suburbs. I think just to finish up on that, I think the amenity of, the, the high amenity of Melbourne's traditional suburbs is something that gives Melbourne a huge strength because this amenity is going to be increasingly important to people's 
locational choices, their decisions to stay in Melbourne and where to live. Most people are choosing or wanting, if they've got the money, to choose high amenity areas, and most of the advanced business service jobs, for example, are in the middle and inner ring suburbs where you have high amenity housing. So if we pull this down and we wreck our, our, our traditional shopping centres, our Victorian and, and um, pre-Second World War shopping centres, we're destroying a massive economic strength in Melbourne. This is something that really gives Melbourne a tremendous advantage in economy because it attracts people and investment and ideas and entrepreneurs and all sorts of other people. You wreck that, you just turn Melbourne into another nondescript city and I, don't, I, I just think that's going to be a huge economic loss. So come on, I'll just finish up with a ring with them and stop. So, <coughs> this, this is another layout. If we just look at, we just, that's the Glen Ira map. So when we come to translating the potential for increased population within the zone, that purple is 80% of Glen Ira was zoned a strong zone. And this is what a lot of councils are trying to, to, to copy. And when you look at this area around Ringwood, um, this is the highway, Ringwood Street. Um, so this is 104 hectares, this is the area that's been under consideration. And the current zone at the moment, it's mainly um, business one, this is Eastland and so on, the commercial area, but residential one here. So it's in the commercial areas zoned for commercial uses business, but it's zoned for residential one, which is the standard residential zone, which as I said before, will the most comparable zone is the new general residential zone, which will allow to continue to allow for medium density development. Now, what's been proposed um, in the new planning scheme in adapting these zones is to turn the residential one areas into residential growth um, and residential growth here. So to really intend and up here. And that will completely change the residential areas that are all the residential ones, for example, further up Ringwood Street and elsewhere. Um, and there have been housing capacity studies which have identified the capacity of, of that area to accommodate <coughs> new housing. So that's just an example of the way this particular council is trying to deal with the new zones. It would have, for example, a lot of implications for um, development in that central core area of Ringwood, um, other parts of zone, neighbourhood residential zones. So um, there's some of the impacts from the application of the new zones. It is operating in a strategic vacuum. We really don't have a, a strong government planning policy which is actually directing this. It's still largely a facilitative process where whole approach of the planning system is to facilitate development and empower um, development interests. Um, and I think the challenge is there now for, for people, for residents, um, to try to influence government and to, to try to get governments to actually grapple with the challenge of this tremendous potential population increase and its impacts on Melbourne. So Kelvin, I'll stop there and we can uh,